welcome to chapter two of the one dollar boat story in which i find out that you don't get a functioning engine for one dollar Just in case you haven't seen chapter one yet, this story is all about the sailboat I got for one dollar when I was 18 years old. I fixed that boat up, lived on her for my last years at university, sailed her around the Howe Sound area on the west coast of Canada, and subsequently let her change my life. This is her, Curlew 3. Designed by Rodney Warrington Smythe from Falmouth, England, her design is called a six-ton pilot, although she is not six tons. She was built by Leslie Blundell at Cowichan Bay Shipyards in the late 1960s and spent her life cruising around the BC coast. Her hull is cedar on oak frames and her decks are fur, a real west coast beauty. Apart from her gorgeous tan bark sails, made especially for her in Ireland, her other method of propulsion was by a 10 horsepower, one cylinder Saab diesel engine, a Norwegian engine originally built for lifeboats that you have to hand crank to start. Now, after that surreal day when Curlew 3 suddenly became mine all because of an email from a stranger, the next step was to go on board and find out what my $1 had just purchased. One of the first things I found was $3 sitting inside, a 300% return on my investment. The boat itself was in surprisingly excellent condition. There were some problems that needed immediate attention. For example, the fiberglass sheathing around the wooden cabin had cracked and moisture was getting stuck behind it. That led to many afternoons spent scraping away the old fiberglass and refinishing the wood. Plus, a lot of the electrical components didn't work. And of course, I had to buy a new battery. But other than that, Curlo was actually a really strong and very well-built ship. The only thing I wasn't sure about was the engine. Not knowing anything about engines myself, I waited until my dad could come visit me for his help in starting it. Luckily, one of my harbor neighbors filmed the whole thing. I know, I just wanted it. So is it water cooled? Where's your water coming in for your cooling? So is there any water coming out of the transit pile? Yeah, that's right. The first thing you told me when I bought my boat is get it going and then look over the side and see water coming out. Is there water, Maya? Yeah, I see it's going down pretty good, so it's dry. Why is it surging? It's supposed to fill it every every 15 or 20. Do you know how to do this yet? Pardon? Do you know how to do any of this yet? No. No? Not a clue. It's amazing that the engine started up like this after three years of sitting at the dock. However, just shortly after that video cuts off, a whole bunch of water started gushing from the back of the engine and we had to quickly shut it off. The culprit seemed to be a rubber frost plug installed on the back of the cylinder. A frost plug is there in case the water inside an engine freezes. To prevent the cylinder from exploding, the expanding water instead pushes out the frost plug. 
Rubber frost plugs aren't too common, but then again, this isn't too common of an engine. The rubber was old and brittle, so we figured all we'd need to do is buy a new frost plug and would be good to go. We ended up having to order the right size of frost plug from the UK, and when it arrived, we installed it with high hopes. Cool. Okay. Maya's starting her engine. <laughs> it's the third time Maya started it up. She's getting to be a pro now. Like it, Maya, having a running engine. It's good. <laughs> bueno. Bueno. Very good. It seemed to work until we brought the engine up above idle speed and the entire frost plug burst out. That seemed to point to a larger problem. There shouldn't be so much water pressure buildup. Something was clearly causing a blockage. I am on Curly right now, and Dad is helping me with a bunch of engine stuff. I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on with the engine or what has been going on with the engine. So it worked, the engine worked when I got Curlew. It would turn on, but every time you would try and push it up past idle, the cooling system would get blocked up. And like little pieces of rust would be caught up in this valve that you could take apart and clean out. And every single time the same thing happened. So it's a raw water cooled engine, which means that it's cooled with seawater, which is pretty rough on metal. It causes an awful lot of rust pretty quickly. And this engine is pretty old. So we figured that the inside of the cooling passages were probably pretty rusty. Um, meaning the inside of the, like the cylinder block. So we took out the piston, it's a one cylinder diesel engine, so we took out the piston, we took out the cylinder liner. I spend about a month pretty much every second day after school coming down here and chipping rust out of the engine with a chisel and a rubber mallet, <laughs> which was quite a time. And now everything's starting to come back together. So I put like this fancy rust preventative coating on the inside of the cylinder block once it was all done. I spent the morning before dad get, was got here cleaning out the crankcase, which is where all the oil is, because it had a bunch of rusty pieces in it left over from all the work that we did. So I spent my morning basically sponging little pieces of oil encrusted rust out of a really difficult to reach compartment. And now dad is working a bunch of magic putting a bunch of things back together. Dad has completely restored the cylinder head. I'll show you an up close video of it because it actually looks like a modern art installation. It looks like some beautiful new steampunk creation rather than an engine because he totally did an amazing job on it. Um, and now we're kind of putting everything back together after the big overhaul of the whole thing. And by we, I really mean dad. I'm just kind of sitting here and learning as he does things and kind of asking questions as he goes. Um, but he is the first class marine engineer out of the two of us and I don't really know an awful lot about diesel engines. So I'm trying to learn as much as I can along the way. And hopefully by the end of this video, there will be an engine that is running and that will push my boat wherever I want to go. The cylinder liner, after being chipped away of its rust, seemed in good enough condition and with still enough strength left. These things are thick and built to last. So we stuck it back in, reattached the head and all the necessary fittings, and figured it was probably good to go. So we've just put the engine back together, or rather Dad has put the engine back together and showed me how he was doing that. And we're about to start it for the first time in probably like a year which is kind of terrifying and I'm really, really scared. So we're gonna see what happens. <laughs> so much faith she has in my work. <laughs> hey, you said it too. <laughs> okay, you ready Maya? I'm gonna oh start Oh my gosh, cranking. I'm terrified, oh God. Okay. Okay, nope, I think there's a little bit of smoke there. Oh yeah. It's coming out the... Where would that be coming from? Out the intake, so there was something going on there. Yeah, there's quite a bit of smoke. Is that a good thing? What? 
That seems like more smoke than there should be for such a small... Okay, well, okay, if you think that's good. Okay, we'll try it again. Oh god, okay. Okay, t take two. Oh my god! Oh my god! Ah! Do you hear that? Nice. <laughs> There's still nothing. Okay, so the water's coming out the transom now. Listen to that. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, Dad! It's working! And so it was. The engine started right up just like it had always done, so eager to run. We let it run at the dock for about 20 minutes, putting it through its paces, then thought would do a victory lap of the harbor. We untied the dock lines, and not five minutes after leaving the dock, bam. Dead. Nothing. The engine had stopped and we could not restart it. As we floated around in the current, I called a friend from the harbor and he came to rescue us with his speedboat, towing us back to the dock. That was a sad day. When we started looking for what went wrong, we realized that we could no longer build up compression in the engine. Somewhere, something had burst. Our guess was the cylinder liner. We thought it had still been in good condition, but maybe not good enough to withstand the forces put on it. We removed it once again, and we thought we could see just the slightest hairline fracture. It was barely noticeable, but given the total lack of compression, we thought it must be the culprit. So off we sent to the UK and, at great expense, got a brand new cylinder liner. We installed the cylinder liner. Still nothing. No compression. And that's when we figured it had to be the cylinder head. It probably hadn't been the cylinder liner to begin with. That thing that we thought was a hairline fracture might have just been a little scratch on the surface. We had gotten the cylinder head professionally redone, cleared out of rust and the valves reseated, but something must have blown apart inside the head, preventing the necessary compression from building. So it was time to buy a new cylinder head. We phoned the same guys in the UK. They said they didn't have any, and that they weren't being made anymore. We phoned the company in Norway that made these engines in the first place. They echoed the same message. We started looking for used parts. Nothing. It seemed like these cylinder heads were in high demand in forums everywhere, but nobody could find them. That's when we got some amazing news. The Norwegian company said that they were trying to find a new manufacturer to start making these cylinder heads again. That's incredible when you think about it. A 50-year-old engine with new parts still being manufactured for it? The only problem is that we'd have to wait for at least six months before we could get the new cylinder head. So we waited. And waited. We didn't have any other choice. And so over six months passed until finally it was ready. Again, at great expense, I ordered one. My dad helped me to install it, and at long last, Curlew had a working engine. Okay, so we just started the engine for the first time since last summer. Uh, it's been almost a year. I didn't film the very first start because... You just wanted to get it going. I just wanted to get it going, <laughs> and I was also nervous that it wouldn't work. But this is the second start. Um, here we go. I'm so, so pleased. <laughs> Do you have water on, Maya? <laughs> yeah, everything's on. I just started. Okay, are you, you're going to do the compression? Yeah, okay. and I'll give you throttle. Okay, hang on. Hang on a we'll look at that. Here's the throttle full on for start. And now Maya's going to... We're, we're going to turn the compression. Okay, decompression is on. Maya's going to start cranking. Go for it, Maya. Ha <laughs> ha! 
<laughs> there it is. <laughs> so much time I've been waiting for this moment. <laughs> Nothing beats a marine diesel, Maya. <laughs> that big flywheel spinning around. And there's that big smile on Maya. And since we had already had it started, you can see that out the stern here, we've got a nice little flow of water. There it is. So there it is. Look at that. So we even have cooling, which we didn't have before when all of this started. Listen to that sound, hey Maya? Let's Tiny see. bit of water coming how? out of the exhaust fitting. Look at how, how slow can we go? Just a drop every now and then. You can grab either a 5 8 or a 9 16 wrench, Maya, and give it a little touch. How's that? Is it, a, is it a happy sad now, Maya? Uh, Don't worry too much about that. We'll start that. There's still a drop on there, but yeah, I think it's better. We'll get it. It'll burn itself in as well. <laughs> and that's it. The story of happy sad on happy crew. Hopefully loop. this and is it's the a end happy of it. Maya. I really hope this is the end of it. <laughs> it's just start and go now. Turn key, as they say. Uh, we'll have to take it through its paces, put yeah. it into gear, yeah. put another spring line out. Right on. Okay, tough for now. We'll do that and film that too. Yeah, okay. So give us a demonstration of changing gears, Maya. Okay, so gotta pull it back to idle speed first. Okay, engine is slowed right down. Then I come down to this janky lever which needs to be replaced. <laughs> Into neutral. Curlew's engine is full of character, just like the boat. It requires patience and hard work to start it and maintain it. But it rewards you with its steadfast reliability. Curlew, like all boats, rewards me for the time I put in. Every fresh coat of paint or every freshly sanded piece of wood did as much for me as it did for the vessel. The bolts I tightened and the screws I drilled into place were as much about building my own strength as they were for Curlew's. So good! Happy Sab! Happy Sab! Happy Maya! So this whole journey, although long and expensive, left me stronger at the end. The first time Dad started that engine down at the dock, I didn't even know how to start it for myself. And now I am intimately familiar with the inner workings of a little marine diesel. I can troubleshoot and I can fix. Curlew has taught me a lot. Now you're probably all wondering what happened to Curlew. And trust me, I'll get there. But that'll have to be in Chapter 3. If you'd like early access to the next chapter, and if you're interested in supporting my creative efforts, please consider checking out my Patreon page. Patreon has allowed me to keep making these videos and to increase their quality. Normally, I make videos about the adventures of my husband and I on board our Vinda 32, but I thought it's also important to know where I came from, and Curlew is a giant part of that story. So, become a part of the patron family, and perhaps you'll even be invited on board our Vinda for a drink somewhere in the world. Until next time! <laughs>